Uh, excellent. So uh, thank you very much, everybody, to be uh, here today for the seminar series on complex systems. Uh, on, the, on this occasion today, we have the honor to have uh, with us uh, Satya Mayundar. I'm going to briefly present Satya, although he is a uh, he makes uh, no presentation. Satya did his um, wait a second. Uh, Satya did, uh, did his uh, BSc in physics at University of Calcutta. And he was ranked first among 2,500 students. After that, he did his master thesis, uh, MSc, in also in physics at the uh, University of Calcutta, and he was ranked first among 200 students. Then he did his PhD at the Data Institute of Fundamental Research, uh, working under the supervision of Professor Deepak Dar, uh, Dar on a, on a self-organized criticality in some files. Uh, then he uh, he went through a series of positions. He was first a uh, postdoctoral fellow at uh, at and Bell Labs. After that, he was postdoctoral fellow at Yale University. He became reader at Tata Institute for some time, and then he became a research a researcher at the University Paul Sabatier Toulouse. And uh, after that, from 2003, he uh, became director of research at the. Uh, a laboratory of uh, theoretical physics and uh, statistical modeling at the University of uh, Paris. Uh, he's a theoretical physicist with research interest in, uh, in the area of uh, equilibrium and non-equilibrium statistical physics. His research topics include, among others, string value statistics, random matrix theory and its applications, persistence and first passage properties in non-equilibrium systems, classical and quantum resetting, and various problems in random walks, statistics of records, etc. He has an enormous list of uh, honors and awards, uh, too, uh, too many to enumerate here because otherwise he's, he will not have time to do his seminar. He has over, over uh, more than 300 papers, uh, around 70 PRLs, science, nature, etc. Satya, thank you very much for being here. The floor, is, the floor is all yours. Please take it away. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Isaac, uh, for the invitation and for your kind introduction. And it's a real pleasure to be in front of you, even though it's virtual. I wish I could uh, give a talk in person; that would have been much, much more fun. So anyway, so we have to live with it. So, uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, just a very simple stochastic process, which is this run and tumble particle that most of you are familiar with, probably. But I'll I'll define it more precisely. So it's a non-Markovian stochastic process, uh, and uh, and we'll uh, just try to understand uh, the survival probability or persistence problem uh, in this uh, simple stochastic process. And uh, so run and tumble particles are basically self-propelled active particles. These days, there's a lot of interest in active particles, and most people actually study interacting active particles, and they lead to many different and in, in interesting phases and phase transitions and so on. But uh, what I want to show you is that even at a single particle level, that is at the non-interacting level, just a single run and tumble particle can actually show um, very interesting universal behavior. And that's the sort of main topic of my talk. So this is sort of a work, a very recent work, which is uh, basically done by two of my, uh, two of our graduate students, uh, Benjamin De Bruin and Francisco Mori. And we do, are doing their PhD with me and Gregory, uh, and Gregory Sher. And also, we collaborated with Pierre Ledusel from Nicole Normal uh, on this work. And this is sort of published in some recent uh, papers here that you can, uh, you can find. OK, so here is the outline of my talk. Uh, so I'm going to just first tell you briefly what is persistence or survival probability. I mean, uh, and then uh, I just tell you a little bit uh, about, uh, very briefly, about the run and tumble particle. What is this process? And you know, in, uh, I mean, it was known in the mathematics literature for a very long time as persistent random walk. And more recently in physics literature, it's called run and tumble process, but it's the same process basically. And I want to talk about the main question of this seminar and, and the result. Uh, and the result was at least to be in the beginning, as we'll see, you know, it was you know, quite unexpected, at least to me. Uh, and, uh, and then we tried to understand this unexpected uh, behavior. And this was, we realized that there's a deep reason for it. And this is this power Anderson theorem that some of you may have heard about, but I'll, I'll remind you what it is. And, uh, and then I'll just briefly sketch the derivation of the main result, and then I'll talk about generalizations and uh, conclude. Okay, so that's the sort of rough plan of the talk. Okay, so let's start with uh, persistence or survival probability. So what is it? So imagine that you have a stochastic process, one dimensional, for a very simple x tau versus tau. 
and I start at some initial position x0, and uh, this, this process is going, and I observe the process up to time t, and I ask, uh, what is the probability that starting at x0, this particle does not cross the origin up to time t? Okay, so this is the survival probability. So as if there is a uh, absorber sitting at the origin, so when it hits the origin, it will get absorbed. You ask, what is the probability that it does not hit the origin? It does. It survives up to time. Okay. So this you can ask for any stochastic process. You know, any continuous time stochastic process except tau. It can be Markovian, non-Markovian, whatever. Okay. And uh, and we also know about the first passage probability density, which is defined as the uh, so t is the random variable here. So f t d t is the probability that the process crosses the origin for the first time between time t and t plus d t. Okay. So, so this is the first passage, and first passage and survival probability are very simply related, because you know if the first passage occurs at time tau, and if it is after t, that means the particle must have survived up to time t. So integral t to infinity f tau d tau is simply the survival probability up to time t. So which means that the first passage probability is just the negative derivative of the survival probability. So this is just the flux of particles. If you think of them as the non-interacting particles, this is just the flux of particles to the origin up to time t. At time t, so this is the this is the uh, first passage, and they are they are just simply related. So you can ask for this question for a very general stochastic process, and there have been of course enormous amount of work. Um, so it's very easy to compute it for you know uh, Markov processes such as Brownian motion, which has no memory. But for non-Markovian processes, it turns out that this is extremely hard. Okay, and uh, because of the finite memory, non-Markovian means that the process has a finite memory. The noise is not uh, delta correlated. And uh, so then it becomes extremely hard. I mean, there are some special cases for which you can solve, but in general, it's a very hard problem. Okay. And, uh, and there was a lot of activity, mostly in the physics community, in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s, and uh, both in the statistical physics as well as in mathematics literature on this uh, survival probability. Physicists call it persistence probability. And uh, for various uh, non markovian processes, uh, and so I'm not going to go through all these details, but if you're interested, so there are these two uh, reviews, one from the physics that I wrote with uh, Alan Bray and Gregory Scherer, uh, and, uh, and there's a maths review, which is by Frank Orzada and Thomas Simon, uh, and uh, this is more, uh, more or less around the same time in 2013-14. So it has actually basically all the developments uh, on that took place uh, during, during these 20 years of uh, two decades of time scale, basically. And also there is, of course, book by Sid Redner, but Sid Redner's book is mostly for Markovian processes. So, so today's talk, I mean, I'm going to talk about the uh, survival probability for a specific non-Markovian process. And this is this uh, run and tumble process in D dimensions. And as I said, you know, this problem basically, you know, it, it came up again in the context of active particles. Uh, and I want to uh, tell you about, uh, about this, uh, this uh, process and the survival probability in this process and and the main you know emphasis of my talk would be this uh, there's some kind of surprising universality that you will see okay so so what is run and tumble process so let me just uh, remind you so uh, so all of you know about passive brownian motion i mean so passive brownian motion which is on the left picture here so you have a yellow particle which is like a pollen grain which is immersed in a liquid and the liquid molecules which are just you know just diffusing around it uh, just uh, you know, fluctuating and moving around. And this guy has no autonomous monar motion on its own. There's no inherent motion. It moves because it, it's being bombarded randomly by, uh, by the molecules around it. And uh, so if there is no surrounding medium, this particle will not move. So in that sense, it's, it's, not, you know, it's not autonomous motion. It's imparted by the molecules around it. And this is the you know, classic uh, uh, Brownian motion that we are all familiar with. Okay, so this is the uh, Einstein, Pera, Langeva, whatever uh, uh, Brownian motion. Now, in contrast, the active particles, the run and tumble process, this is actually seen in E. coli bacteria, for example. E. coli bacteria has some flagellar tails, uh, and these tails actually gives it a sort of self propelled motion or directional motion. So it moves opposite to the, uh, the, to the, to the flagellar, flagellar tail. And uh, so what happens is that this particle, you know, uh, so first of all, it moves inherently on its own. It doesn't require any outside medium, unlike the passive. That's why it's called active instead of passive. And the way it moves is that it starts from a point uh, and it chooses at random a direction and a velocity. And then uh, it sort of um, velocity from some distribution. And then it, it moves ballistically along that direction with that velocity up to a random time, which is typically exponentially distributed. Okay? And then 
it tumbles, meaning that uh, it changes the direction at random and chooses a new velocity from some distribution W of V. And again, it runs up to an exponentially distributed time. And uh, the exponential distributed has a mean, which is called gamma inverse, which is the typical persistence time of this. Uh, so this is a persistent, it's called persistent random walk because it, it sort of tends to persist in one direction up to a typical time, which is the mean persistence time gamma inverse. Okay? And then again, it changes direction. And then this, this, these two phases of motion run and followed by tumble and then run, tumble, run, tumble, it continues forever. So, so this is autonomous motion in the sense, as I said, you know, it doesn't require any outside uh, you know, uh, particles to impart collision. It moves on its own. Okay? It absorbs energy directly from the environment. And then it just uh, moves, uh, for example, E. coli bacteria when it's searching for food. This is the typical motion of these particles. Okay? So there have been a lot of work on this uh, in the active literature. Uh, mm, uh, but this is also the, you know, the in maths literature, this was well known. I mean, and this is called the, uh, the called the persistent random walk. I'll come to that in a minute. And, uh, but this is the basic process. So you have basically this parameter gamma inverse, which sets the time scale, uh, which is the mean persistence time. And it's non-Markovian because it has a memory, you know, it tends to move in that direction up to finite time. It's not, you know, instantaneously changing direction, unlike long down in motion. So that makes this process non-Markovian. And, uh, and then, so the, so the two parameters, one is the time scale, of course, which is just a, just sets the time scale. But then the main parameter is this distribution of the velocity that you choose after each tumbling, okay? So W of V is a parameter. And of course, the dimension in which this particle lives is also a parameter. All right, so, so more precisely, the model is very, so I'll, I'll talk about here, you know, just as I said, you know, in the active literature, there are a lot of work on interacting RTPs. And they give rise to interesting exotic phases uh, like clustering and you know many other things. I mean, which I'll not talk about motility induced phase transition and so on, so forth. Here I'll just you know just focus on one single particle, and just as a stochastic process of this single particle motion itself is quite interesting. That's what I want to show. So so the precise model is the following. So I'm in D dimension and the particle starting at the origin. And uh, so it, 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 you know, it chooses a random velocity V drawn from some distribution W of V. And the only thing I'll assume about this W of V is that there's no overall drift. That means you know, it's, if you reverse the velocity, it's exactly this, I mean, it's, the distribution has the same value. So there's no overall drift basically, okay? And, but it can be Gaussian, it can be anything that you like, okay? And, uh, and then once it chooses the velocity from this distribution, it, it moves in that direction. Uh, in that with that velocity speed v, uh, speed v and and it moves along uh, that direction up to a uh, time which is also a random variable which is chosen from a exponential distribution with parameter gamma okay? and this as i said this gamma inverse is just the mean, mean persistence time or run length basically run time and at the end of the uh, run the particle tumbles meaning that it chooses a new velocity now again from the same distribution so it's a renewal process and then again, it runs up a new random time chosen from this exponential distribution, and the process goes on. Okay, so the run lengths li, which is just the velocity vi ith uh, run times tau i. Okay, so that's the model, basic model. So, so as I said, you know, gamma inverse just sets the time scale, so which you can set it to be one, and so you have just two, two you know, uh, two parameters here, d, which is the spatial dimension in which the particle is living and this uh, velocity distribution after each tumbling. Okay. Now there's a special case, a special choice of the velocity distribution, where you say that the velocity as you know, it has a fixed speed. So it's a delta function V minus V naught. So speed is always V naught, V naught is just a constant. And it chooses the direction of the vector V at random, isotropically, okay? So this is what is called the standard RTP, meaning, and this is what is mass literature is called the persistent random walk. Okay. And, uh, and this particular choice of uh, WV, this persistent random walk, it, it goes back, it, you know, a long time back, you know, 1920 by Robert Furth, a German uh, physicist uh, who was working on it. Uh, he introduced this model and then several people worked on it and then again, got, it got forgotten and all, so on. And then finally, Mark Koss in 1974, he was not aware of the literature before. So he was giving a set of lectures in Schlumberger Royal Company and uh, so he was interested in the you know uh, porous in the movement of diffusion in porous media and he actually came up with this model 
for uh, as a sort of model for the oil particles and uh, and he was giving a set of lectures to the to the to the people engineers in the Stromberg oil company and that's why he he's the one who gave the name persistent random walk and then followed by Marcus. I mean, there have been a lot of work both in the physics and maths community. And there are many results which are known for this process. So for example, uh, simplest question is, what is the position distribution at, at some fixed time t? Okay. So this has been very well studied. What happens is that at a very long time, when time is much, much bigger than this typical mean uh, persistence time, you would expect, I mean, if I see these uh, trajectories from a very far away, I mean, uh, then it will look like a diffusing trajectory. So it goes to converges to a Brownian motion for at very long times. But when time is of order gamma inverse, then of course you start seeing this uh, memory effect uh, because you know the, you start seeing this ballistic part of the trajectories, and that actually uh, sort of uh, can change the behaviors uh, of the problems in the system. And so this position distribution is very well studied, and there's still work going on uh, currently. But I'll not talk about that too much today. And uh, so what we are interested in is actually in the first passage probability of this problem. And uh, the first passage problem has been studied so far in D equal to one, in one dimension. And with this choice of this particular W of V, which in one dimension simply means that, uh, you know, velocity is either V naught or minus V naught with equal probability. Okay. So basically the, it flips uh, the velocity after a random time and uh, moves with constant velocity V zero and then changes sign again. and goes on and go on and so forth okay so this problem was you know studied again survival probability of in this problem has been studied by many people starting with Orschinger in 1995 george wise uh, and many other people and uh, again you know still the work is going on on this on this problem and many different aspects of this okay so the question that i'm asking is what happens for d bigger than one and for arbitrary w of v but i'm going to assume that there's no drift for the moment and so so just a driftless distribution and d bigger than one. So for arbitrary w v, and I want to know what is the survival probability. But what do I mean by survival probability? Let me be precise and tell you exactly the question that I want to ask. So the question I want to ask is the following. So you are in d dimension, okay? So let's say I'm showing you the picture of a trajectory in two dimension, and uh, I'll ask a very simple question, okay? Which is the following. So suppose that the particle starts at the origin of your space. And uh, so you have a hyperplane at x equal to zero. This is your absorber. Okay. So all I'm asking is, what is the probability that if I look at the x component of this RTP process okay, in d dimension, what is the probability that the x component does not change sign? Which means, what's the probability that starting at the origin, the, the trajectory stays to the positive um, x-axis and does never become negative up to time t? Okay. So this is a survival probability. This is the simplest question. You can ask, of course, many other questions, but this is the you know, zeroth order question. And uh, so D equal to one, one knows the answer. I want to show you in a minute. And I want to ask, you know, what happens in higher D? Okay, and, and for arbitrary W of V. Okay. So that's the question. That's a precise question I want to ask. Okay. And in particular, I want to know what is the dependence of S of T, the survival probability on these two parameters, namely space dimension D and the velocity distribution W of V. And as I said, the special case in D equal to one and the special choice of uh, you know, constant speed with the isotropic equal probability. So this case is very well known and well studied. So let me just remind you briefly uh, through this case, what is the result known? And then we'll, I'll come back to higher dimension. So this special case is a very well studied problem. So what happens here is that you can, you can see that uh, the, you can very easily write down a sort of Langevin equation, if you like, uh, for this process. So what you have is your position of the particle, okay? So it's moving with constant speed V naught, but with a noise sigma t, which is telegraphic noise, uh, which uh, you know changes from plus one to minus one with a constant rate gamma, okay? So what that means is the following. So the sigma t plus tt, so this is the noise if you like, uh, so this is either plus one or minus one. So it starts, let's say with equal probability, let's say with uh, plus one, and then it, you know, it, it stays, uh, so in a small time dt with probability gamma by two dt, it changes to it changes flips its sign, and with probability one minus gamma by two dt, it retains its sign. Okay, so this is what is called the telegraphic noise uh, because it goes like plus one minus one and so on, and uh, and so you are driving a position of a particle. Your you know this is overdone particle if you like. Uh, so the velocity is uh, just dx dt the rate of change of position is just v zero. V zero is a constant time sigma t. Okay. 
So this is the this is the one dimensional model because you see this WV. This is exactly so the changing of telegraphic speed, telegraphic noise coincides with the tumbling of the particle, if you like. Okay. So so what happens here? So here the sigma, you see the sigma, the telegraphic, the driving noise of this particle. So if you, it's very easy to compute this correlation function, sigma t1, sigma t2. So this is just exponentially to the power minus gamma mod t1 minus t2. Okay. So you see immediately that it has a finite correlation length, which is the gamma inverse. And that makes this process non-Markovian because, I mean, we know that, I mean, in the limit gamma goes to infinity, you see this essentially goes to a delta function and then you are back to usual Brownian motion. But because of this uh, finite memory, it makes this uh, process non-Markovian. Okay. So, uh, so this is the sort of one-dimensional uh, run and tumble process. And as I said, yeah, in the limit gamma goes to infinity, essentially the RTP, you know, just converges to a Brownian motion. Okay. So, so, how, so, and now you ask, okay, so what is the probability that, you know, this X does not change sign up to time T starting at some initial value X zero, which is positive. Okay. So that's the survival probability. So now in order to solve this problem, so, I mean, because it's a non-Markovian, uh, so you have to do a trick. I mean, you have to sort of extend your uh, space uh, of degrees, special degrees of freedom. So you say, okay, I mean, what I'm going to take look at is not just X of T, but I'm looking, going to look at X of T and Sigma of T, okay? So if I, I have to keep track of both variables, and in, if I keep track of both variables, then essentially in the X Sigma plane, this just becomes a Markovian process. So that's why in a survival probability, when you define, you have to define survival probability, what's the probability that the particle survives up to time t starting at x naught and starting with the initial speed v plus or initial speed uh, minus, okay? So sigma zero, so this is the extra degree of freedom you have to keep track in order to make the process Mar Markovian. And, uh, and if you do that, then it's actually very easy to write down a sort of backward Foucault or Kolmogorov equations or Foucault Planck equation, if you like, uh, which is very easy to write down. So you write down, you know, del S plus del T. So how does the survival, survival probability change with time starting at X naught by varying X naught, okay? So then you can see that there's an advective term which comes because of this motion, you know, ballistic motion. And there's a minus gamma by two S plus because if it is at the plus state, it can change to minus state and thereby it goes away from S plus. So there's a minus gamma by two. And if it was a minus, then it can change to plus. So there's an incoming term, which is gamma by two. And similarly for minus S minus, you can write exactly a similar equation. Uh, so these are these are very easy to write on a card. So sort of these are coupled equations, uh, S plus and S minus, uh, but they are first order equations so that they, because they are Markovian ones to keep track of plus minus both. Uh, but the only thing, tricky thing about these equations is that you can, I mean, when you try to solve it, you have to provide the proper boundary and initial conditions. So what is the boundary condition? So the boundary condition is that, that if you are at the origin, if you start at the origin with a negative velocity, then you, of course it's not going to, you are not going to survive, you're going to cross immediately. So the survival probability starting with a negative velocity at the origin is zero, but S plus at T at X equal to zero is unspecified, okay? I don't know what that, because you can be starting at the origin with a positive velocity and you can still survive, okay? So that's unspecified. And you have the other boundary conditions that if you take X naught, if the starting point X naught to be infinity, then of course you are no matter whether you're plus or minus, you're going to survive in a finite time T. So this should go to one, okay? So these are the two boundary conditions. Uh, and you have the initial condition that at T equal to zero, if your X naught is positive, then strictly positive, then uh, certainly you are going to survive with it probably to one. And uh, so this is the initial condition. So you have to, so you have to solve this pair of first order couple differential equations. With the uh, with these boundary initial conditions, and this is sort of easy because you can eliminate s minus or s plus, uh, and um, just add them up and subtract them, and you can actually solve these equations. Uh, I'm not going to show show you the you know, details of these equations, but once you have s plus t and s minus t, and then you say that okay, initial uh, speed can be either probability half with positive or probability half is negative, so you can this is the total survival probability. Okay, so, so it has an you know, explicit expression, which is not very illuminating, so I'm not going to show you. But uh, what we are interested in is what happens when you x not equal to zero and you start at the origin exactly. Okay. So you can solve this just in the Laplace space, that's the easiest way to solve. So I'm not going to show, show you the general solution, but it turns out that if you start at the origin, okay, 
and you ask what's the probability that the process does not uh, cross up to origin. Note that this is different from the Brownian motion. The Brownian motion, if you start at the origin, you will immediately cross the origin. So survival probability is exactly zero for Brownian motion. But here, you know, this for the for the RTP process, even if you start at the origin, you survive with a finite probability. And this survival probability is just given uh, by a simple expression, which is e to the power minus gamma t by two. And these are just uh, basal functions, modified basal functions. Okay. And in particular, for large time t, you see that just using the asymptotics of i0 and i1, it uh, decays like one over square root of pi gamma t. So as you see that at late times, it sort of behaves like a Brownian motion. So you get back your usual one over square root of t results. Okay. Uh, but you know what is not clear is in this problem is that you know because you are putting x not equal to zero you cannot just use the brownian result for to get this asymptotic decay so you have to first solve it for finite t and then take the large t limit so anyway so the point is that this is this is known and it's, it's quite non-trivial uh, this result uh, for and you say it's a finite probability even if you start at the origin so that means you start at the origin but, but with the probability half you have a positive speed so you can actually survive and that is the probability of survival so the question is, uh, how do we compute it for d bigger than one and for arbitrary speed wv? Again, without drift, I mean, just a uh, symmetric wv. So the point is that, you know, there's, there's you know, it's, it's, it's actually very hard because you know, here you see that I'm using very specifically the fact that v0 is constant and you have equal probability. That's why I could, you know, basically Markovize this process and you know, going to the other things and, uh, so even in one dimension, it's not clear if you have an arbitrary speed WV, okay, uh, this velocity, I mean, uh, how to solve this problem. It's not, it's not clear at all. Okay. So, so even in D equal to one with arbitrary WV, it's a non-trivial problem. And then the question is what happens for higher D? Okay. So, and the other, I mean, main sort of reason of complication also is the fact that unlike in the Brownian motion, D dimensional in Brownian motion, D dimensions be all different components, they get uncorrelated. Okay. So if you are asking for the X component, effectively it's like a one dimensional problem. Okay. So this is very simple. But RTP, you cannot do that because RTP, you know, it's moving at a constant speed in a certain direction. So so all the X and Y components get strongly correlated. So so you cannot just you know decouple the different dimensions so easily. And so so this is the this is the sort of you know difficulty in solving this problem. Okay. So what do we do? So of course, what you do is first to do simulations, right? So we did a simulation. So first we wanted to check the result for d equal to one. So d equal to one, of course, uh, this is I'm plotting the survival probability starting at the origin uh, as a function of time t. And uh, so these uh, red dots are, are red uh, circles are the simulation results. And you see that it matches you know, perfectly with the analytical prediction, which is this uh, basal function system. So it works very well. This was a good check. So then you said, okay, so let's go to d equal to two. So we go to d equal to two. Okay. And d equal to two, we choose the velocity distribution again, constant speed, but with isotropic angle. So we choose the direction at random, but speed is constant. And we plotted this. And you know, we, could, we didn't believe it. It was exactly on the same curve. Okay. For all t. It didn't change from d equal to one. We thought there was a bug in the program. We checked, um, no, every time it was giving the same answer. Then we go to D equal to three, exactly same answer. Okay. And then we said, okay, let's change the velocity distribution. So we choose a Cauchy distribution for the velocity and isotropic angle. And again, it's on the same. Okay. And this was really amazing. I mean, I mean, we, we didn't believe it really in the beginning. Okay. That uh, it's, it's totally universal in the sense that it's independent of dimension. It's independent of the W of V as long as W of V is symmetric. So, so this was the main result. I mean that the, the, this and the answer is exactly the one D answer. Okay, so this 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 answer seems to be universal, and it's universal not just for large t, it's universal at all time t. Okay, even at very early times. Okay, and and it's totally independent of D and totally independent of the velocity distribution W of V. Okay. So this was the surprise. Okay, so this uh, super universality, and we wanted to understand that what is the origin of the super universality. Okay, so what I want to show you in the rest of the talk that you know this is actually a deep consequence of something called Sparrowness theorem, which I want to 
tell you now about. And, uh, and, but to prove that, you know, the, to use this power Anderson theorem for this problem requires a little bit of non, some more non-trivial steps, which I'll take you through at the end. Okay, so let me remind you what is power Anderson theorem. Okay. So spar Anderson theorem is a famous theorem in uh, probability theory for, for one-dimensional random walks. Uh, so so the, the theorem goes like this. So imagine that you have a one-dimensional discrete time random walk, which means that you have a random walker, which so it's discrete time but continuous space. Okay. You start at the origin, x0 equal to 0. And at each step, you choose a uh, jump increment, x little xk, Okay, so in my notations, the little xk will be always the jump distribution, jump, and capital XK will be the position. Okay, so little xk, you choose um, from an IID uh, independently at each step from, uh, from some distribution P of x. All you need is a symmetric and continuous P of x. Okay? This can include, for example, Levy flights. Levy flights means that P of x has a fat tail. It's 1 over x to the power mu plus 1, where mu is the Levy index, which is between 0 and 2. Okay? So when mu is between zero and two, the first moment, uh, second moment doesn't exist. So these are basically long jump uh, walks. Uh, so this is a general random walk in one dimension. And if the second moment is finite, then of course at long time, you would expect this random walk to converge by central limit theorem to Brownian motion. But in general, it can be Levy flights also. Okay. So you have this one dimensional random walks. So only input is this uh, jump distribution P of X, which is assumed to be symmetric and continuous. Yeah, and you start at the origin. So this is a Markov process, of course, and uh, and you ask the following question: <clears throat> So what is the probability that starting at the origin x zero equal to zero, what is the probability that the you know the the trajectory stays positive, that is non-negative, up to n steps? Okay, so that means probability that the position at step one, position at step two, position at step n, they all positive. So that means this guy you know does not cross the origin. So this is a probability, it's just a number, Q of n, okay? So of course it, it, it should depend on P of x, that's what you would expect. So the question is, what is Q of n, okay? It's a, it's a non-trivial question, okay, for arbitrary P of x. And what Spar Anderson proved, so okay, before that, I mean, so formally what, what this is, this is just a multiple integral. So you see the increments, little x size, they are just uh, IID variables. So the joint distribution of all the noises is just i equal to 1 to n product of p of x i. Okay? But what you are asking, your observable, is that the actual positions are positive. That means first one, a capital X1, which is little x1, first jump, that should be positive. Then x1 plus x2, which is capital X2, that should be positive, and up to n steps. So this is, this is the multiple integral you want to do. Okay? So obviously, you know, it depends on p of x, and uh, you want to know what the, what the answer is for large n. Okay? So how to compute this, uh, this multiple integral? That's the question, okay? And it's non-trivial. And what is amazing was that Spar Anderson proved that as long as this P of X is symmetric and continuous, this answer Q of N is totally universal. It does not depend on P of X, okay? The answer is just 2N choose N, 2 to the power minus 2N, okay? So it decays like one over square root of pi N for large N but this is universal for all n, not just for large n, okay? Totally independent of p of x, okay? So this was, I mean, you know, amazing theorem and, uh, you know, Spardeson proved it by, uh, by using combinatorics and, you know, uh, combinatorial arguments. And, uh, and when you see this result, you know, people think, ah, oh, this is quite, you know, it looks very simple. I mean, it's just a binomial, some two a binomial number, two n choose n, two to the power minus two n. So there must be some simpler proof of this result, okay? So there's a lot of work on this and many people tried to find a simpler proof. Okay? And it turned out that all these proofs were either, you know, bigger than uh, Spar Anderson proof or, or more complicated. So this is a non-trivial result. I mean, you, it's not, the proof is not very simple of this. Okay? And this is of course a, an equivalent statement is that the generating function of this QN is just a universal function. It's one over square root of one minus z, which is just the, you know, coefficients of z to the power n of this guy. And this is independent. So this is the, either this statement or that statement, that statement equivalent. So this is independent of P of X. Okay. So as I said, many subsequent proofs, I mean, including physicists and, uh, you know, famous people like Uriel Frisch and other people, but, uh, you know, it's, it's not, 
is, there is no easy proof. So let me, I want to, you know, show you a sim, sim, relatively simple proof. I mean, although there's, I mean, I'll, you know, put things under the carpet, but just to, you know, give you a um, sort of very simple idea of how to prove this. So this is some work that we did recently with uh, Philip Munex and Gregory said. So the idea is the following. So you take your random walk, uh, the discrete time random walk, okay? And these uh, increments are IID from down from P, from P of X, okay? What you do, you take your trajectory and you look at the global minimum of this trajectory. Okay, so this is the global minimum here. And suppose that this global minimum occurs at step M. So that means there are M steps before it and N minus M steps up after it. Okay. Now you observe the trajectory from the global minimum. That means you change your frame of reference to this, this level, dotted level here. Now when you look at this dotted level, the probability that, okay, so, so this is the local minimum, okay? So now you ask uh, that this, you know, this time at which this local minimum occurs, which is M in this, uh, in this picture. So this is a random variable. It will vary from trajectory to trajectory, okay? So I can ask, what is the distribution of the time at which this random walker achieves its minimum? Okay. So probability that the T mean is equal to M, given that you have N steps. So this is the object I want to compute. Now, what is this object? So this object, I mean, you see that, you know, if you've seen from the point of view of this minimum, you see, you can decompose your trajectory into the left and to the right, okay? Now for the left part, what you see is that essentially that, you know, when you have shifted your reference frame here, that this part of the trajectory is just the survival probability. That is, you start from here and in origin is variable because the aim, you know, the actual value of the minimum can be anything. So that sort of, you know, uh, varies this point as well. So essentially the left part is just the survival probability. So this is just QM, right? So what's the probability that's starting at the origin? This is your new origin now. What's the probability you survive up to step M? This is the QM. Now on the right part, this is just survival probability up to step N minus M, you start at the origin. And the fact that this is, you know, Markovian, that means once I specify the value here, it, it completely, you know, decomposes, you know, decouples these two parts. This is the property of the Markov process, okay? And so this is just a simple product of these two, okay? Okay, very good. So I don't know what QM is, okay? So now this guy, of course, P of T, you know, this distribution this is a distribution PDF, so it must be normalized. So which means, uh, which means that the probability of T mean M, N, when I sum over all M, because M can take value from zero to N, minimum can happen either at the beginning or up to at the end. So when I sum over all M to M equal to zero to N, since it's a PDF, it must be equal to one. So which means this sum M equal to zero to N, QM, QN minus M equal to one. So this is just a convolution. So if you take the generating function of this, you find that Q tilde square Z is just one over one minus Z, which means Q tilde Z is just one over square root of one minus Z. Okay. So this is a very sort of simple proof. Of course, it helps to know the answer but uh, this is so far, I mean, this is the simplest proof of Spar Anderson theorem that I found. So, this was this uh, sort of recent uh, short note that we wrote in JFZ uh, just to show this proof. Okay, so what has Spar Anderson theorem got to do with our RTP problem? Okay, so it's not immediately obvious, I mean, that why, the, why I can apply this Spar Anderson theorem to the RTP problem in D dimension. Okay, because you know, the Spar Anderson theorem, as I told you, it holds for discrete time Markov process with IID increments. Okay. Whereas RTP in D dimensions is a continuous time non Markov process and with correlated increments. And also the number of steps n in a given fixed time t is a random variable. Number of steps means number of uh, tumblings. Okay. So it's a random variable. So it's not immediately obvious that how I can uh, apply this Spar Anderson theorem to this problem. Okay. So that was where our contribution came. I mean, we had to really uh, need a few non-trivial steps to intermediate steps to, to bring the problem, RTP problem to a form where we could apply the Spar Anderson theorem and uh, in the Laplace space. Uh, and this is what I'm going to uh, show you in the next uh, few slides. So just a sketch of the derivation, I'll not, is not you know, too much technical, just, just I'll just give you the brief, rough idea of uh, how we proceed essentially. So, okay. So, there are a few, three, four steps essentially. So, step one. So, step one. So, I have my RTP in D dimension. I mean, I'm just showing you the picture for D equal to two. So, I look at the X component. Uh, okay. So, this is the X of tau, X component. So, we say 
one dimensional continuous time non markov stochastic process okay now if you look at this so x of tau versus tau so this is a continuous time process like this and what you see is the trick is to actually look at the uh, the positions of the particle at the end of each tumbling so x component of the position if we call it capital xk okay so capital xk just the x component of this x of tau at the end of the tumbling so i keep track of only at the end points okay? i don't i don't care what happens in between okay? so so capital xk is just the position of the rtp at the instant of the kth tumbling okay so then of course i can write capital xk as previous position plus this extra jump that happened okay and this extra jump xk is just the x projection of the of the kth run length right so this is the kth run length so i have to take the x x component x projection of that so that will be my increment in the xk okay so then you'll say okay this is already looking like a one dimensional uh, one dimensional uh, walk but there is little complication of course which is that the number of steps number of tumblings is not fixed it's a random variable because what is fixed is is a time t so it's not the same ensemble if you like okay so we have to take into account of that fact so now i want to calculate the survival probability x of the original process x of tau continuous time process up to time t okay that's my original problem starting at the origin and the the main point to realize is that this probability is the same as the probability that the x case that is if i ensure that at the end of each tumbling you know the particle stayed positive then that automatically ensures that during the whole interval the x of tau is positive because you know if if these guys at the end point of the tumbling if they are positive then obviously at any intermediate time it must have been positive it could not have crossed because if it had crossed it has to come back and change uh, the direction so that's not possible so and similarly the opposite way also you can show that you can show that if if the actual x of tau is continue um, positive then of course little x case are all positive but the reverse is also true so this event is exactly the same event as the probability of the end point of the tumblings that they are all positive okay and this is a joint probability of this this event and the number of tumblings and number of tumblings is also also a uh, sort of random variable given capital given the total time t okay so this is the object we are after okay and then i have to sum over all possible number of tumblings to compute this okay so this is the crucial step so i need so for, to solve my problem i need this this uh, this joint distribution of the positions at the end of each tumbling and the number of tumblings and uh, so therefore all i need is actually the joint distribution of the increments if you like uh, because if i know the increments i can construct this event uh, so i need the uh, joint distribution of the increments and the number of tumblings and they are of course correlated variables okay given the fixed time t so this is the object i need this is step 1 step 2 so i want to compute this object uh, so how to calculate this object so so i notice that you know the the if you look at the run times okay so let me call tau 1 tau 2 tau 3 tau n as i said they are also independent variables right exponentially distributed okay the only thing is that the last run is unfinished right because i'm i'm just cutting off my time t here so the last run uh, after the nth tumbling uh, where n is a random variable the last uh, run is not yet finished so i can actually write down the joint distribution of the run times and the number of tumblings n and uh, this is very simply so you see that this is just the you know each of this each of these tau y they are independent variables so is gamma i to the power minus gamma i tau y normalized each of them so i id up to n minus 1 and the last guy because it's not yet finished that means you have to integrate this guy from tau to infinity and so you just don't have this gamma factor you just have it to the power minus gamma tau n and of course the total Uh, time is fixed okay so this is the you can check that this is normalized to one and this is the joint distribution of the increments of the of the sorry of, of the run times and the number of tumblings okay and and one little trick is that you can just you know divide by 1 over gamma and put this guy inside this factor so that you treat up to a global 1 over gamma factor you treat all the runs on equal footing it's just a you know technical thing but this helps okay so this is so i know the joint distribution of the run times uh, okay so now now what is the next step uh, so step 3 so i want to calculate the joint distribution of the increments and the and the number of tumblings 
Now, what is the increment of the projection x1? x1 is just tau1 v1, right? So this is projection in the x direction. So this is the vector. Tau1 is the time, random time, and the v1 is the velocity. So I just need to take its x component, and that will be my x1, that will be my x2, and so on. Okay. So therefore, you can see, so this is the ugly uh, equation, but it's not very, it's very easy to understand this. So what is the problem? Joint distribution of the com x components uh, of the increments and the number of tumblings. So, so first of all, you know, these tau y's are all random variables, as I showed you, they're exponentially distributed product. And then what happens is that these vi is also random variables, and each of them chosen independently from w of v. So I have an integral also here. And then I have to just make sure that the x component projection is xi. Okay, so this is just a delta function of this uh, this this l l one vectors times the ex is the unit vector in the x direction. Its projection is xi. I have to make sure that the total number of tumblings is the uh, total length of the uh, runtime is t. So this is uh, formally this is the exact expression. Okay, of course computing this is a little bit harder, but you don't need to compute. It turns out. So what do you do? So when you see a delta function, the first thing always to do is to take the Laplace transform, right? So that's immediately simplifies because when I take the Laplace transform, so what happens is that the delta function gets e to the power minus, you know, the uh, something into summation tau y's, and then all the product, they get decoupled and it becomes very, very simple. So what happens in the Laplace space, therefore, is that this joint distribution of the increments, it just becomes uh, gamma over gamma plus s to the power n, this uh, overall factor comes out. And here I write this as product of P s tilde of x i. And this is just the Laplace transform of this exponential minus gamma tau into this W V T. So this is an ugly object, but I don't need to compute this, it turns out. Okay. So now the crucial thing is to realize that, okay. So, so the, all the dependence on dimension D and the, uh, the W V, the speed distribution, is all encoded in this P tilde of X. Okay. And is parameterized by this S Laplace variable. So I said, you know, the exact form of this is not very important. But the crucial point is, I can now interpret this p tilde of s x as a PDF of a random variable, okay, parameterized by s. How? Okay. So first thing you can check that this is of course positive, and second thing you can check that this is symmetric because W v is invariant under a change of v. So therefore, you know, when you change of v to minus v, uh, then you know if you change that is just changing x to minus x. So therefore, this is symmetric. And you can check very easily that this is normalized to one because when you integrate over x, you know, the delta function goes away. W is normalized, so it gives you one. And this guy is totally normalized, it gives you one. So it's trivial to check that this is normalized. So I can interpret this as a probability distribution, some probability distribution which is parameterized by this S, okay? And, uh, and that's a trick, okay? So therefore, I mean, formally, I can invert this Laplace transform and this is the object I was after. That is the probability that the joint distribution of the increments and the number of tumblings given t is just the you know the Bromwich contour into this object. Okay, that's the main result, and it's very simple. Okay, I don't need to calculate this object. Only thing I know is, is I can interpret this as a PDF. Okay, once I have that, then this is the last step. Uh, I want to compute the survival probability that the probability that the RTP does not change sign up to time t, starting at the origin, doesn't go negative. So that means, as I said, you know this probability is just the Formally, this is the object. So you have a multiple integral. You have to ensure that E positions, you know, these are the increments. So the positions are all positive. And then I have a joint distribution of these guys, okay? which of course they are highly, you know, this in, unlike the usual 1D random walk, you know, these, these XIs are very strongly correlated as you can see here. Okay? In the Laplace space, they are uncorrelated, but in the real space, they are correlated. Okay, so you have this. So to compute this, so I mean, immediately you see, I mean, formally I just use the Bromwich contour, which and it goes outside. So all you have is one over gamma, this gamma by gamma plus s to the power n times q n, and this q n is just you know just I mean, I just substitute this result, you know, uh, this result here, and so the q n is uh, exactly this object okay, with p s tilde of x i here. But I mean, I showed you right in the beginning that this is exactly the Spar Anderson, you know, survival probability of a random walk, where the random walk, the increments are chosen from the, from a PDF, IID PDF. And this PDF here happens to be just independent on S and W, V and D. But the point is Spar Anderson tells us that no matter what P tilde of S is, you know, this object is always universal. 
and its generating function is just one over square root of one minus z minus one. I mean minus one here because this is from n equal to one to infinity. If you go from zero to infinity, it will be just one over square root of one minus z. Okay, so we have the answer. So so basically, you see that immediately the independent dependence on d, w, v, etc. All these things disappears in this in this object, and uh, and this server object is totally independent of that. So I just have to substitute this result here, and this comes in the generating function form already. So I just have to substitute this result here, and that brings me to the final result. So substituting this result, so you see that you just have to Laplace inverse uh, in this simple object, and if you do this inversion, you can do it exactly, and you get these basic functions, which happens to be exactly the only result which was derived by solving these backward focal plane equations, coupled backward focal plane equations and so on. So that's the derivation. So the, the, the point is that the several probability, therefore, you know, of a D-dimensional RTP starting at the origin and with the velocity distribution WV, which is symmetric, there is no drift, is totally universal at any time T, not just for large T. And, uh, and this is the sort of main, uh, main, uh, main argument. So you see that it's not immediately you can apply Spar Anderson theorem, but we have to go through some intermediate steps and it actually applies the Laplace space than the real space. Because in real space, the increments are very strongly correlated, but in the Laplace space, somehow they, they get uh, decoupled and, uh, and then, then, uh, then you can apply this Spar Anderson theorem. Okay, so this is the sort of main uh, main uh, content of my seminar. Now let me just uh, very quickly tell you um, the consequences for other extreme value observables going beyond the survival probability. So, for example, I, I just mentioned uh, about the um, time of the minimum. So you can take your RTP process. You look at the x component again. Okay, so you have this process, and now I look at my trajectory, and I ask you know what is the time t max either or t mean? What's the time at which it achieves its maximum. Okay. So I have a d-dimensional RTP. I look at the you know, x component, and I'm asking what's the probability uh, of the time at which the displacement in the x direction becomes maximal. Okay. So this t max is a random variable. I want to compute this. And again, I will not go through the details, but um, basically, you know, similar ideas. Again, you decompose the path on the left and right, and you can actually work it out. So I'll not give you the details. But it turns out that it's, again, totally universal. It's independent of D and the velocity distribution WV for uh, symmetric ones at any time T. Okay. And in fact, it has this uh, exact form, which is uh, this A of T max times A of T minus T max plus A of T plus two delta functions. And this A of T is precisely the survival problem. So if you know the survival property, you can actually compute this distribution of T max, time at which the extreme offers. Uh, and again, you know, in 1D, uh, this was solved by very complicated again. This part partial PD by solving the PDs by uh, Singh and Kudu, and uh, but but this contains this result. I mean, it's a much more uh, general result in any dimension d and any w of d. Then you can ask uh, other questions. You know, record statistics. You know, that's another object that people are interested of in stochastic process. So if you have a you know discrete uh, process like discrete time process like this, record means you know here I'm talking about lower records. Uh, so you say that a record happens at step k if the value x k of the process there, you know, is lower than all previous values. Okay, so it's a, it's a record on the negative side there. So so this is the so the probability. What is the, what? Is the, so this is the probability that a, you know. I mean, you say that a step x k is a record if its value is less than all its previous values. So in this picture, you see that you know these these points here, which are shown by red, are the records. These guys here, they are not records. Okay. So, so you can ask how many records are there up to step, up to time t of this RTP process, okay? Number of lower records. So this is again a random variable. And you can calculate its full distribution, but for instance, uh, you know, full distribution again, turns out to be totally universal, independent of d and wv at any time t. And this is again a consequence of this Spar Anderson theorem. You, do, you need to work out some of, some of the details, but that's not important. Main idea is that you have to apply this Spar Anderson theorem. I mean, Apply means after these uh, manipulations. And for instance, if you calculate the expected number of records up to time t, it turns out to have an exact form, exact function, like totally universal at all time t. And in particular, at large time, it grows as square root of t. And uh, so you can check. Uh, so in the simulation, of course, uh, the average number of records up to time t in d equal to one, two, three, four, and with many different distributions, of course, they all fall on the same curve. So this is totally universal again. Few generalizations. I mean, so this was the basic RTP process I looked at. Uh, 
where you know for example in 1d uh, this is just a you know telegraphic process you go uh, with a constant velocity and then you just uh, tumble and you go in the uh, opposite direction and then you go like this uh, so this is run and tumble but you, there are other processes that people have looked at uh, which is uh, what is called the uh, for example this one second one here uh, this is called the wait then jump model that means you know the, the that you 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 wait uh, you wait at before tumbling and then you just instead of moving ballistically you just jump to the new positions uh, and then again you wait for it some for a while and then you jump so it's like this continuous time random walk if you like okay so uh, so this is the wait then jump model that people have studied also and then there's a mixture of the two that means you there's a waiting time distribution and then there's a um, uh, there is a uh, runtime distribution, and uh, so 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 all, in all these models again, you can work it out. All these details, I'm not going to go through this, and you can actually uh, calculate, uh, you know, the um, the survival probability and the distribution of the time of the maximum as well as the number of records, and they're all again universal, uh, independent of d and w v at any time t. Of course, they are, you know, universal in each of them, meaning that you know the, the, the result for this model is of course different from this model, okay, about this model. But for each model, it's universal in the sense that it's independent of D and uh, the velocity distribution. Okay, so let me just uh, summarize and conclude. Uh, so, so essentially, you know, I mean, I talked about first this uh, basic observable, which is the survival probability of the X component of the uh, D-dimensional uh, RTP process. And for me, this was interesting because uh, first of all, it's different from, even though the position distribution becomes Gaussian and Brownian-like at late time T, in the survival probability, there's a big difference because in Brownian motion, if you start at the origin, the survival probability is zero exactly identical for any time t. But for uh, for RTP, for any time t, it's a finite non-trivial quantity. And uh, moreover, I mean, this is totally universal. That is, it does not depend on d and does not depend on the velocity distribution for any arbitrary w of v. And this was, you know, for us, it was really, you know, surprising result. I mean, in retrospect, you see that this is due to Spar Anderson theorem. But in the beginning, you know, we spent quite a some long time, you know, to, to figure this out. Uh, and, uh, and, and I mean, we were really shocked by looking at the simulation result. I mean, that was, for me, that was the fun part of it. And, um, and then, you know, this, this has been subsequently, you know, other models have been studied. And uh, for example, uh, Lacroix Chetouan uh, was an ex-student of ours and uh, Francisco is a current student. So they, they, uh, they looked at a discrete time version in one dimension. Uh, of this uh, of this RTP process, and they found also this um, similar university. I mean, similar mapping to Spar Anderson. And so, of course, uh, there are many interesting open questions. You can ask, you know, uh, what happens to the universality when the runtime distribution p of tau is not exponential? Because I used uh, the exponential distribution very specifically. I mean, you can take a power law distribution, for example, algebraic, and uh, then it turns out that uh, you know the only complication is in the last step of the run, uh, last run, because you cannot, for exponential distribution, you can, you know, rewrite the last run distribution also as an exponential and put them on equal footing. But if the P of tau is not exponential, you cannot um, write the last step as, a, as, a, as an exponential again, because it's an integral of P tau, so it's different. Uh, so, but, but again, in the long time behavior, you know, it doesn't change really. I mean, again, this universal result holds as long as, uh, as long as its uh, second moment is finite, uh, and uh, and for Levy type of flights, again for, you know, for finite time t, you lose this universality. But uh, at uh, late time, again, it's restored, uh, and you can actually compute for this. Uh, the other question is what happens when this symmetry condition is not there? That means, uh, for example, if you have a drift, uh, you know, constant drift, for instance, uh, and uh, then what happens? Uh, so it turns out that you know you lose uh, some of this universality, of course. Uh, and uh, but but there is some vestige of university still left, uh, and uh, so this was uh, subject of some another recent paper with our student uh, Benjamin Dudwin and Gregory, and uh, so we could solve it exactly in one dimension for arbitrary W of v again using this mapping tools kind of spar random walk problem, but in higher d it's uh, it's very difficult and this is totally open. You don't know anything about higher d. Okay, so. So this is an open question for d bigger than one and non-zero drift or I mean arbitrary w of v, which does not have the symmetry. Then uh, what can we say about the several probability? And of course, I mean, and these days, uh, the finally these days, you know, these days there are a lot of experiments uh, even for single particle RTP, and uh, it would be nice uh, 
if I, if uh, they can, you know, verify some of these results in, in, the, in the real experiments, and uh, that would be great, of course. So, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Sadia, for this uh, actually very fantastic uh, seminar and uh, actually amazing uh, set of results. So, colleagues, uh, do you have some questions for Sadia? If, uh, if, if you have, please uh, just unmute your microphone and, uh, and ask directly, or you can also write on the chat and I can, uh, I can read them. I have. Yeah. Uh, so, so Hernan, uh, you first, please. Go ahead. Just a, a, a simple uh, extension. What happens if, if the process does not begin at x equals zero? Uh, very good, very good question, of course. So, <clears throat> in fact, in one dimension, we actually, in this paper, that uh, the last paper, uh, we have actually worked it out in detail. See, what happens is very interesting. Even for random walk, you can ask this question. You know, I mean, because we know, uh, just for, just, just think of just a discrete time random walk problem, okay? I mean, we know that if we start at x equal to zero, then Spar Anderson tells us that this is this one over square root of pi n. Okay. Now, on the other hand, if you, if you, you know, if you have a, a jump distribution with a finite variance, we know at long time it becomes a Brownian motion. And for Brownian motion, we know the answer is, you know, our, our function of x naught over square root of 4 dt, which means x naught over square root of 4 dt, right, for at late time, basically, this goes like 1 over square root of t. Now, is this 1 over square root of t is the same as 1 over square root of n that you see in discrete time things starting at the origin? And the answer is no. You know, many people make this mistake, you know, uh, I mean, you know it very well. I mean, many people actually get confused. They think that, you know, discrete time random walk, this power Anderson one over square root of n is exactly as Brownian one over square root of t. No, this is wrong. I mean, in fact, I mean, there's a, you know, what happens, the Brownian motion result you get when x naught, your starting point, is also of order square root of t. That means, you know, it's in the scaling limit result when x naught is large, t is large, but x naught over square root of t is fixed, okay? So then you get this error function result. Whereas if you put x naught equal to zero, but t uh, fixed, uh, t large, then you get one over square root of pi t. And in fact, there's a scaling function, crossover function, which you know, connects this power Anderson regime, which where you know, x naught is of order one, and uh, when x naught is of order root t, which is the Brownian result. And you can actually work, work out this scaling function ex explicitly. And this was work, some work done we did with uh, Philip Munex and Gregory Scher some time back. And, uh, and same thing happens here also in, 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 this part, in this RTP problem. And this is exactly uh, in, this, in this paper that you see that I'm citing here, uh, where we worked out uh, what happens when uh, the starting point x not is not equal to zero exactly. So, so the statement is that, I mean, you, you recover this result as long as, long as x naught is of order one and not of order root t. Okay. Then you more, um, then basically up to overall factor, x not dependent, uh, you get back the uh, the the x not equal to zero result. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, Hernan. Uh, Denis, I think you had a you had a question. Please go ahead. I'm in your microphone. Yes, actually, I had exactly the same question as Hernan. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yeah, no, this is this is a very interesting question because you know this always bothered me that you know what is the sort of uh, scaling that connects. Uh, the spiral lesson to, to Brownian motion, okay. And, and then it turns out that there's a non-trivial crossover scaling function, which goes from x naught of order one to x naught of order square root of t. And you can actually explicitly compute this scaling function. So it's a very interesting scaling function, actually, so. Okay, uh, sorry, go, go ahead, Danny, do you have a? Yes, the results are, are valid for it in a, for continuous increments, but you, you are, Talking about uh, okay, yes, yeah, the Lacroix Lacroix one article uh, yes. about discrete time, but yeah, discrete uh, it, time. It, it is a, it is a continuous space. Yeah, yes, yeah, it's a continuous space. Yes, continuous space, discrete time. Yeah, basically, you say that you know you will, it's a lattice model. I mean, kind of a discrete time model that the next step, you just remember what was the jump in the previous step, and with some probability you accept that jump, and with some probability you don't accept this jump. Basically. So just a one step persistence actually. Okay, yeah, thank you. Any other questions? If not, I would like to ask at least one or we'll go half a bunch. 
So I mean, Satya, how, how far are you are you with the with the case of uh, the last case you put the, the case of uh, higher than one dimension and uh, non-zero drift? We don't know. We have absolutely no idea. I mean, that that's a totally open open problem. So you cannot even write because I was playing here uh, around with a piece of papers and can can you write down at least the joint distribution of the that the of the position of the particle? That you can, right? Yes, that that you can. I mean, uh, but the point is that you know when you I mean when you have don't have this symmetry of the um, x's. Yeah, it's it's a little bit. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is that you know when when you don't have this symmetry, when it depends explicitly on this. Uh, P of x, right? Even for a random walk. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so then, you know, Qn is no longer universal, and dependence on on P x is quite non-trivial. And uh, so, what happens in higher dimensions and all these things is this P, P tilde s the Laplace transform itself. Mm -hmm. It becomes quite ugly, and uh, for arbitrary P of x, and I don't know how to extract any asymptotic results from this even. Oh, I see. Because I have a, like a path. I was doing a path integral derivation that I could not using the the constitution you did. Yeah, yeah. Right. No, no, you can, you can, I mean, formally you can write down something, but you know, to extract anything, you yeah. know, in, uh, asymptotics out of it is, is very un, uh, highly non trivial, actually. So, okay, okay, very good. Uh, any other questions? If not, Satya, it was uh, great to have you here in Mexico City. Thank Beach you very much. Yes. Yeah, let us hope next time you can uh, come to visit us. Uh, shall we thank uh, Satya for this fantastic talk? Uh, uh, thanks, Satya. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Yes. And thanks everybody for, uh, for being here. I'll see you next week for the last uh, seminar of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the seminar series. It's still not confirmed or more or less confirmed, but we'll have Tony Leggett and he's going to talk about superfluidity. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. See you. See you.